quick in 1 Samuel chapter 30. We have 112 days till we start gaining daylight. 112 days, start getting daylight. That would make it 115 days till my birthday, so everybody knows as well. I know you're all praying about that right now. I appreciate that. (laughs) 1 Samuel chapter 30. Verse number 6, I think just 6, 7, and 8. It says, And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, and every man for his son and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abathar, the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod, and Abathar brought thither the ephod to David. And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover it. Verse 4, the distress there was strong. It says, David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we ask your blessing upon the service. Lord, we pray that you'd be glorified and honored. Lord, I pray that you would work. Lord, feed us through your word, encourage us. Lord, draw us closer to you. Lord, I pray that you'd be glorified and honored. Lord, control what I say and how I say it. Lord, I certainly do pray if there's anyone here who has truly never been converted. Lord, I pray for that. I pray for that repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Please bless and work, and may your spirit have free course and be a help. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So, start off with a question. How how do you actually turn tragedy around? How do you respond during times of incredible disappointment, loss? How do you recover from that? In our text, we really do have a great example we have five things I want to show you that David did. At this point, let's set the stage for what's taking place here before I get into this message tonight. If we were to go, well, you don't have to turn there, if you go back just a couple of chapters, going back to the conclusion of chapter 26, I believe it is. Yes, conclusion of chapter 26 is the last time King Saul would be seeking for David. At the time of the writing of this chapter, Saul is just about to be killed. Uh, There's a war that's probably taking place really right around this time, what's taking place in chapter 30, and Saul is going to be killed, and David is getting ready to be king. Now, he has no idea. But in chapter 26, Saul had ceased from chasing David. He'd even told David at the conclusion of chapter 6, he let him know, listen, you are blessed of God, you are going to do great things. And uh, uh, David, though, actually responded in a way that was just shocking. Saul had been chasing him for years, and David was tired, and David makes a horrible decision in chapter 27, a horrible decision because of discouragement. He decides to go live with the enemy. He heads to the land of the Philistines. He had a relationship with one king there, and he goes there, and the king gives him his own town with him and his 600 men and and their families, Ziklag. He gives that to them. And so David is dwelling in the land of the Philistines, even though Saul had actually told him, again, Saul had lied about it before. It wasn't that Saul lied. Saul acted on emotion. When Saul told David at those times, I'm done seeking you, I believe he meant it at the time, but he never acted on principle. He always acted on the emotion of a situation. And so when his emotion changed, when his mood changed, the principle no longer guided him, his emotions did. And so he changed. And however, in chapter 26, that would be the last time he would seek for him. David, though, not trusting the Lord, believing his discouragement, forgetting the promises of God, makes a wrong decision and moves in with the enemy. By the time we come to chapter 30, we're about 18 months into it. It's almost 18 months into this. 
And some of the events that took place while he was there, he found himself in some messy situations. At one point, David, to try and show, uh, try and prove allegiance to the Philistines, the king who had given him the city that was his and his men, he, he was making as if he was going into Israel and performing raids and coming back with spoils and saying, look what I've done. Now, he wasn't going into Israel and doing that at all. He was going to the Amicalites and, and, and getting them and actually destroying them. Now, that's getting ready to come back on him right now. When you're in chapter 29, they're getting ready to go to war against Israel. And David is in a mess because he's called up and his men are called up and the Philistines are getting ready to battle Israel and David's in this, getting ready to fight against his own countrymen. Now, I don't know how he would have responded, but through God's grace, there was an intervention that took place and some of the lords of the Philistines had told him, no, no, David is not going in the battle with us. They said, we're telling you, he's going to turn and he's going to fight against us. And they said, they reminded him, listen, this is the same guy they were singing, Saul had killed, you know, thousands, David, ten thousands, and he said, we can't have it. So they send David back. When you come into this chapter, it's David's journey back to the town. And he's on his way back to the town. And you can just see his men. He's there with 600 of his men. They're heading back. They're probably in the neighborhood, I don't know, maybe a mile or two out. And they see their first concern, smoke rising in the distance. There shouldn't be any smoke rising in the distance. That should, they should not be seeing that. It looks like in the same direction, in the same place as Ziklag, right where they're from. And you can imagine, as the talk began, wait, wait, what's that smoke? What, what's going on? You can imagine their pace quickened. I would guess before too long, as they were getting closer, it's going into an all-out sprint to get back home. They realize something is horribly wrong. And as they get closer, they can see the fires. They're sprinting home. When you come into chapter 30, they finally arrive, and to their great distress, they get there. Their town has been leveled. The town has been leveled. The Amicalites had come and paid retribution on David. They destroyed his city. They took captive their families, their wives, their daughters. The men arrive in the city, and they see what has happened. You can just imagine the incredible distress that was taking place in their, in their life. See, in their, the, their town destroyed, their wives and children taken captive. The grief would be intense. Their thoughts would be tormenting them at the thought of their wives and daughters in the hands of evil, wicked men. And as we read in verse 4, they wept until there were no more tears. On top of this, David has another problem. The men turn against him. They begin blaming him and his leadership for the predicament. And in all honesty, they're right. David moved him into the land of the Philistines. He made that decision. It was David's decision to raid those villages. So they decided they want David dead. <clears throat> so the men who have come to serve together with David, under David that were willing to give their lives for him, now want him dead. Grief can change things quickly. So not, as, not only is David's home burned to the ground, his possessions lost, his family gone, but he's lost the confidence of the men that he's been leading. Now, I actually certainly feel for David you know, in, in all that he's dealing with in this situation. Um, and him knowing, this is your own fault. It was a result of that discouragement, a result, result of that backsliding condition up to this point in his life. This is the lowest point of his life up to this point, right now. <clears throat> so how does one come back from that moment? How does one return from this condition that David finds himself in? How does a person turn something that is tragic into triumph? Now listen to me. There are times, and there will be times in life, as we live on this earth, that the Lord puts a ziklag in your life. 
And how you respond in those times of great disappointment or loss or those who turn against you. How you respond is so important. David is there. He is with the men and has no more tears. I could imagine him feeling alone. But as we read through chapter 30, David makes a complete and utter turnaround. He would regain the confidence of his men. He would recover everything that had been taken. And I don't know about you, I would love to recover the things the devil has taken in my life. So how do we return? How do we recover? Boy, David gives us a great pattern here that is a principle found throughout the Word of God. So let's look at this. <clears throat> Verse 6. Number one, I'm going to give you five things here, and they're important, in going from, during those times of great disappointment, great loss, tragedy, whatever the situation might be, to be able to a place to turn it around. Verse 6 says, and David was greatly distressed. That's probably putting this so mildly right now. Again, put yourself in David's shoes. Abigail is gone, taken captive. His house is burned. The men that he's been leading want him dead. He feels the weight and the responsibility David was greatly distressed for the people spake of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved. Every man for his sons and for his daughters. Here is the first key is the next two words. And you'll understand here in a minute what I mean by that. But David. But David. What that is signifying, the conjunction there is signifying a change. A change is getting ready to occur right now. In spite of all this, even though all this is going on, even though they're facing this tragedy, even though it's tragic, they have loss, they have disappointment, they have anger, they have fear, they have grief, a change is coming. But David. David decides to return. He made a decision to do something about it. What David did in that moment when it hit, and he realized in all the way, even in the midst of his utter disappointment, his grief and his distress, he decided, I'm not staying like this. I'm not. He decided, I'm not going to have a pity party right now. This would have been so easy to do. This would have been such a great temptation just to go to the men and, and hand them the stones. But he made a decision to return. That's what it's signifying here as we read on. But David, he made a decision, I'm not staying down. If you don't get this one, do you understand the other four things are not going to matter in your life? One thing that keeps people down is they simply never make the decision to do something about it. There's several reasons why. Let me cover a couple of them. These are not exhaustive, but there's some common ones as to why they won't come out of it, why, why they just won't make that decision to turn around, why there is no but in their life. Even though I'm in the great distress, they just stay in it. Truth is, when we're all down, distress or grief hits, we have a tendency to think that no one else has ever been in as bad a situation as we're in. And if the enemy can make us think that our situation is uniquely bad, then we will despair thinking that there is no way back. 
If he can get you to think, no, this is unique, this is worse than anything. Listen, he has your mind, he has the thoughts, and you're beginning to think there's just no way back. Simply not true. You begin to think there's no hope and you are wrong. Distress and despair begin to set in. And boy, think when you're in that mindset and you begin to make decisions. Mm. Number two, when you're facing it, you begin to weigh what has taken place, the problems against your own strength. And you think, I can't do this. You think, I can't do this. You simply look at it from your, your own strength and what you have. You're looking at it just in view of the circumstances instead of the truth of, of the Lord. But I'll get to that. Right now, I need to stay focused on why this takes place where people don't come out. Again, one is tendency to think that this is unique, this is so bad, there's just, it just can't happen. Number two, you weigh the problems with your own strength and you realize, and in your mind it becomes a reality to you that it's not possible. You begin to measure, measure the difficulty of the situation with your own ability. And that produces fear rapidly. You begin to consider the situation with what resources you have. And you can't see a way out of it. Being a Christian, know, actually knowing the Creator, there's so much that goes with that. There's always a way back. You can never go so low that the grace of God cannot grab you. I want to show you one way God uses these situations. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. The Apostle Paul, whose Christian life was Filled with difficulty, hardship, disappointment. I mean, again, I, I just don't know of a, of a Christian who has led a more challenging Christian life than the Apostle Paul. I want you to notice something that when he talks about the difficulties he's faced in chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia. Now let me stop right there. We're not sure exactly what he's talking about. Some say it's what took place in Acts chapter 14, what we just came through as, as we're going through the book of Acts. Some say it's what took place in Acts chapter 19. We're, we're, it's just not certain what he's referring to. And some say it's, it's something that's maybe not even recorded based on when they thought this epistle was written and it seems to be so fresh in the Apostle Paul's mind that some distress had hit that, that's not even quite revealed to us in the Word of God. So we're not sure, but we know it was something incredibly difficult that he had faced. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we are pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. Something horrible had happened. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves. Now, this is what he learned in it. This is what he's telling you. Verse 9 is the key right here. That we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead. That's what he's saying I learned. He's saying all the things I just told you, when I looked at the situation, it was beyond our strength. He said I was in a place where all I could look to was God. 
in his power. And he knew, listen, there's, there's nothing too difficult for the Lord. Nothing. So God can use the ziklags in your life to actually cause a greater dependence in your life upon him. He can take something and still use it where you learn to turn upon the Lord and trust Him more and it actually strengthens your walk with Him. Because it's those times you think, "I've I've got nowhere else. That's where David is. David has nowhere else to go right now. God can use these times to get you to trust in Him. Second step. So number one is this. You've got to have that but, that, that determined to change, that determined, I'm not staying down. I'm not. This, this moment, this event is not going to define me. Back in 1 Samuel chapter 30. Verse 6 still. But David, here's number two, encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Now David has been in a backslidden condition for about a year and a half at this point. He's living in the land of the Philistines. Uh, He is even deceiving uh, uh, um, the king that's given him the land with doing these raids and actually telling him he's raiding Israel. It was discouragement that led to the decision when King Saul had proclaimed him, listen, you're going to do right, you're good, I'm done, David. I I will not seek for you anymore. But discouragement took over, he made the wrong decision, he's been in this condition, but now David is here, he has nowhere to turn but to the Lord. If you decide, I'm not going to stay down, there's one important lesson you're going to have to learn in life, that is how to encourage yourself in the Lord. Think about this. David has no one else. Abigail is gone. She's been taken captive. His men want him dead. He is alone. But then it's as if he remembered, for sake of my point right here, when he encouraged himself in the Lord, I'm not alone. And that's true. You never are. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. Never alone. He said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. That's true, by the way. I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. This is one of the benefits, if you will, of how the Lord can use a ziklag in our life. He can teach us how to encourage ourselves in the Lord. To find encouragement when no one else is there. When everything's so difficult and unsurmountable and negative. To be able to encourage yourself in the Lord. Listen, this is the key. The key is not running to a drug. The key is not running to a bottle. The key is not running to escapism. The key is running to the Creator. Remember, in this moment in time, David is in great distress. I mean, incredible grief. Nothing but tragic news. He's standing in the midst of his burned down city. His men acting in emotion, ready to take it out on him. So to change this, no doubt when David recognizing uh, uh, um, despair starting to set in, he said, no, I'm not doing it. He goes to the Lord. Keep in mind for David, this is a major change. Remember, I went through the life of David with you. What I tried to do with the life of David was this, is to correlate what event we're at in his life up until the time he became king, with psalms that he wrote. From the start of chapter 27 through this chapter, there's no psalms written. How could he? He's in a backslidden condition. Not one psalm was written during this time frame in his life. Now, though, he's going back to the Lord.
In order to do that, he had to have some discipline of mind and of thought. That's where it starts. One to begin to seek the Lord and allow Him to say, please, help me to think right. I wonder what thoughts the Lord brought to David's mind when he began to encourage himself in the Lord. I wonder if David thought on the times when he was a teenager. And it wasn't necessarily all that long ago at this age. You know, we're probably, I'm trying to remember my time frame by the time he becomes king. You know, what's the 10 year, 7 year? I wonder if he started thinking on the times of that that incredible sweet fellowship he had with God when he was that that shepherd boy. Those sweet times with the Lord. I bet you the Lord brought those to mind. I wondered if he remembered the time that the Lord delivered him from a lion and a bear. I mean, if you think about that, that really is incredible. I mean, I'm running. That's all there is to it. I'm knocking you down so the bear gets you, and I'm running. (laughs) Unless it's Bob. I can outrun Bob. That's not a problem. But I do think maybe those are some of the thoughts that came to his mind. How the Lord gave wisdom and help. When most, most would have been taken and killed. But the Lord was there. Maybe he remembered that moment when he was the only brother not called into the room when Samuel showed up. And Samuel looking under God's direction to anoint the next king of Israel because the Lord was done with Saul. And and Samuel going through all of them. And the Lord telling him, nope, 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 it's none of these. And Samuel's saying to Jesse, do you have any more? Is is there somebody not here? Well, yeah, but, you know, David, ruddy countenance, you know, he's, he's, he's still with the sheep. Go get him. And then I love his statement when he says that. He said, I can't exactly quote it right now for some reason. He basically said this, I will not sit down until he comes. David comes and whew. So there's David, young teenager. There's the prophet. Think of the awe of that. That's standing there in his house. And then all of a sudden, the prophet of God anoints him as the next king of Israel. What a weighty moment. I mean, David knowing that the God that he's been having fellowship with every day, enjoying his time with, just enjoying his youth. By the way, young people, know what, his, know what his youth was about? God. God. God directed, his life was about God. David's dreams was not of defeating a Goliath. Do you understand that? It wasn't of defeating a Goliath. It was of honoring God. And as a result of that, there were some Goliaths to defeat. You don't dream of defeating the Goliath. Simply dream of honoring God. Maybe he remembered the Psalms that he'd already written on goodness and mercy and grace and the help of the Lord. Maybe he read those again himself. Maybe he sang those songs to himself. Maybe... The thought of the day that he did defeat Goliath came to his mind. Maybe he remembered how just a short time earlier God had delivered him from a cliffside. It was the closest really Saul had him. It looked like David was pinned in. Men, I'm closing in on him all around. He has nowhere to go. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, they turn around. Again, all those times that God was there and God helped when it looked hopeless, looked like there was nothing else to do, and he's thinking again, yes, time and time again, God has worked. He 
You know what I think? I think in that moment when he was encouraging himself in the Lord. All right? I, I think that's what, this is what it's going at. I believe he found more tears over God's goodness. Listen, that mindset is dangerous. Spurgeon, who I, I talk about fairly often, he had battled depression. And this is an interesting excerpt from a story of his life. One day he was riding home, feeling weary, feeling down, battling the mind games. And he had, and there's, there's reasons why. There was, he, he, Spurgeon had a weight on him that he was recognizing really the, the, some of the vile theology that was beginning to come. It was almost as if he could see what was going to take place. There was a weight on him. He was feeling weary and down when suddenly God burst through with, this, with the verse, My grace is sufficient for you. Spurgeon replied, I should think it is, Lord. And he burst out laughing. His unbelief seemed so absurd at that moment. He said it was as if a little fish, being very thirsty, was troubled about drinking the river dry, and the river said, my stream is sufficient for you. It's true of God's grace. Listen, remember, God is real. Don't forget that. It's not a Sunday school story. It's not a fairy tale. Because David made the decision... I'm not staying down. The second thing he did was, i got to encourage myself in the Lord. Because he did that, you know what he's in a position now to do? Make right decisions. That's what he is. He's now in a position to make right decisions. That's what he does. What does he do? Verse 7, he seeks the man of God. He heads to the priest. After David encourages himself in, in, in the Lord, he immediately seeks for the man of God because he wanted to get to the Lord. And that's what he's going to do. He's going to ask for the ephod. A pastor's responsibility is to watch for your soul. That's what it is. So he's... Now in a place to make right decisions. Thirdly, he seeks after the man of God. I'm going to go right into the fourth thing, because that's where David was really going with this. The key is, is simply, I, I mean, we, we have, the pastor has a responsibility, but my job is simply to get you to the Lord. Say, listen, here's wisdom. Here's, here's, here's what you need to do. And in this, we see that with David, because David, fourthly, he sought wisdom from God. He wanted simply God's direction. He's following different principles in the Word of God from Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. He says, I pray thee, bring me hither an ephod. And Abathar brought thither the ephod to David, and David inquired of the Lord. David seeking wisdom from God. He wants God's direction. Remember, the ephod was what was used in this time for help determining the will of God. By desiring the ephod, he's showing he wants wisdom, he wants direction. Get your ephod. Here's the will of God. Here it is. Get on your knees in prayer. Beg God for wisdom and discernment and direction. Boy, in the book of James, when we went through that, we saw the importance of wisdom during our trials. Perhaps a statement I hear the most during difficult situations from people that are facing different things is this, I simply don't know what to do. You go to the Lord. You respond based on principles that are right. It's during those dark times you need God's wisdom more than ever on what to do. He is the one who knows what tomorrow holds. You can just guess at what's going to happen. That's all you can do. That's why you trust Him. You trust Him. Fifthly, 
verse number 9. Verse 8, the Lord responds. But I wanna, I wanna, I'll come back to verse 8 more in a second. I want to jump to verse 9. It says, so David went, he and the 600 men that were with him. So the Lord gives instruction. In verse 9, what we see is this. Here's the fifth thing he did. All right, he, de- he determined, I'm not staying down. He encouraged himself in the Lord. He sought the man of God. He sought direction and wisdom of God. And number five, the counsel that came, he did it. That's what he did. He followed it. What the Lord told him to do, that's what he does. That's what he does. He followed the counsel of God. He followed the direction of the Lord. He just didn't check his box to say, okay, I tried to get counsel from God. He obeyed it. He didn't argue. He didn't tell the Lord, wait, Lord, I only have 600 men. They have no strength. They're worn out. There's no way we can head down for this battle. Because the Lord's sending them into battle. He doesn't argue. He doesn't come up with excuses. He didn't give God a list of reasons why he can't follow the counsel. He trusted the Lord and obeyed. You follow the counsel that God gives you. Listen, and I don't know how many times it has happened where it's, it's in those meetings and then there's the follow-up and, and I'll ask, did you do it? No. Now, we see something that takes place as a result of these five things right here, and that is God's response to David. God's response to David. One, in verse 8, when, when the Lord responds to David, you can see such grace and mercy. You can. I mean, think of what he, he went and lived with the Philistines. Think of where he's at right now in his life, in his relationship to God. He is in a genuine, backslidden condition. But he's returning to the Lord, and it's almost like you see with the prodigal son, the response that is here. God's response, number one, immediately is comfort. Look at what God tells him. David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And here's how the Lord answered him. He was, the Lord was so encouraging and comforting. The Lord said, Pursue. He didn't leave it at that. He could have. But the Lord knew what he needed to hear. He said, For thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail, get this, recover all. David, you're getting your family back. All your men are. All of them. You're getting it all back. The possessions, the things that were stolen, you're going to recover all of it. You think that encouraged him a little bit? You think he took a little bit of comfort in that? The Lord responds with comfort. The comfort was with what? The word of God. God responded with comfort, and I don't have time to read it. Time is, you can read it later, verses 11 through 16. I love what what begins to take place because you see God working. So secondly, what happens is, again, he made the decision, I'm not staying down, I'm I'm going back. I'm going to encourage myself in the Lord. I'm going to seek the man of God. I'm going to seek God's counsel. God responds with comfort. But then we see next God's providence in the circumstance. As they're going along the way, they come across an Egyptian who had been discarded by David's enemies who had his family. That's not, didn't just happen to happen. It was God providentially provided for David. David comes upon him, and get this, David's heart here is amazing. Sometimes the Lord has providence in our life, but because of our own stubbornness or bitterness or blindness, you can't see what's actually before you. David shows kindness unto the Egyptian. He has no clue who he is, really. He shows kindness to him. 
Once he shows kindness, they have the discussion then that takes place. And David says, do you know, do you know where they're at? Yes, he goes, I was, I was one of their servants. They discarded me. Do you know where they're at? I do. I know right where they're at. That's God's providence in this situation. When, when David and his men left, they had no idea they were going to come across that. They're just heading one direction trying to, let's see what we can track. They come across a guy who goes, I know right where they're living. And he was an Egyptian and David had showed kindness. God's providence. Had David not showed the kindness, by the way, it's possible, I don't know, it doesn't say it, but it's possible he would have missed that opportunity. Again, many times we do have God's providence, but I've already mentioned due to lack of character, we miss it. And then we see if we had read on, and I'll conclude with this, he had God's help. Basically, another miracle takes place. As they were traveling, they had 600. 200 of the men were just worn out. It really was not possible for them to go into the battle. So 400 men head in. 400 men head into the battle. They recovered all. Just as God said, all of them survived the battle. Of, uh, there were 400, you can think of how many they took on, because it talks about like destroyed them all. I, think, I, I can't remember, I think it was 400 that left, they had camels or something like that, and they all took off. David recovered all. Could you imagine David running and those men running in and David seeing Abigail? By the way, I think she had a few words to say to David that day. If you ever stop following God again, I will beat you myself. <laughs> but, oh, what a sweet time they had after that victory. What a sweet time they had. But that sweet time doesn't happen if David doesn't determine to return. It just doesn't happen. So how do we get back? How do we recover? What do we do? We determine I'm not staying down. I'm going to encourage myself in the Lord. Seeking the man of God to get the direction and wisdom from God. Then obey it and watch God respond. With heads bowed and eyes closed.